Yeah, so, so there is yeah. so, there is a technical, a technical difficulty here, so we couldn't read the Mac directly. So we have to a Windows machine to the screen. So uh, okay, so we did the hello. Um, so I want to before I start the meetup, I just want to do a meetup by uh, show of hands. How many people have uh, like know about credits? Know about credits? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds about G. Sounds about G. Okay. <laughs> so I'm um, going to skip the time series question. You and the credits. So not a lot of people know credits. So um, how many people have used the Apex? How many people have? Looks okay, like the Apex like so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think okay, we have. Uh, so uh, the out. Uh, here is the outline for the day. So, uh, we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about platform training. Platform. Okay, well, I know a lot of you. I'm going to be here. We're going to talk about what training is. Training services. Talk about. 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 Talk Okay. okay. So, uh, so uh, platform. platform. Uh, so it's a cloud-based so platform. Cloud platform. Cloud platform for industrial IoT. Uh, an example of IoT. An example of IoT application would be. Uh, let's say a very uh, a predictive maintenance application. It's an application that you want to do something in asset. Uh, an asset uh, most of it is like very big machines. Very big machines. And then uh, and then to predict and to make the maintenance on the machine itself proactively. So what happens is if you if you don't predict, then the plan is That's one of the use cases I can try to solve. There are also other use cases around asset optimization to get the best out of your assets. So uh, yeah, there are several use cases like that. The platform is built on top of Cloud Foundry. So if you're not aware, Cloud Foundry is an open source PaaS system. Uh, uh, it has got a vibrant community around it. Uh, GE has a set of core engineers that actually work on uh, work and contribute on Cloud Foundry itself. Uh, uh, the platform, uh, the Predix platform provides the rich set of services. So if you're an industrial developer, you don't have to necessarily work on all the scaffold services and stuff like that. The platform offers you all of those by default. So uh, you can get that going and then start to work on the real problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, I mean, as a past platform, of course, everything is managed. The infrastructure is managed. The security is provided. Uh, and there is also a marketplace. I think someone Earlier here was just mentioning about a marketplace that's there in Predix. So if you have your own service, your own idea, you can basically put it on Predix and then monetize it. Okay. Uh, this is a. Okay, it is not refreshed there. Okay. So uh, this is an interesting picture that actually uh, shows the type of user that we deal with. Uh, so this is not a traditional IT environment. Um, Folks, uh, so the data that we have to present to these folks will have to be based on the environment that these guys are operating on. It probably has to uh, be specific to the asset that they are working on and the environment around it. So uh, this is like uh, our users, user base. Okay, so here is the architecture of uh, Predix. Um, if you see at, at, a, at a high level, there are a few components that I want to highlight. So there is a wind turbine on the left, of course. There is an application on the right, which actually like uh, gives you a broader perspective of what's going on. But what's in between is what Predix is all about. So there is a Predix machine component, which is almost like uh, a runtime that gets deployed on the edge. Okay, that gets deployed on the edge. What it does is it constantly monitors the asset sensors and then does some analytics locally and then gives the feedback back to the turbine. Uh, what it can also do is it can use the connectivity as a service to send it to the cloud. So uh, we do have a service that can essentially use a local cellular network in some case, uh, satellite-based network in some cases, uh, and some cases dedicated networks to connect to the cloud itself. So and on the cloud, uh, we have our infrastructure that's covered for uh, operating on industrial workloads. Uh, we've talked about Cloud Foundry. Uh, on top of it, we've built a bunch of microservices. So uh, there is an operational service that gives you uh, ability to do uh, DevOps as a service. Uh, there is one that actually gives you BizOps as a service. That means if you want to monetize your service, you can use that to operationalize. So the data portion is where we come in. It's, it's part of our team. So we build foundational data services for uh, 
for all of the predicts platform. There is, okay, sorry. Kind of move beyond. Um, so then there is asset service which uh, provides you a way to model your assets, uh, their relationship, their sensors and stuff around it. Uh, of course there is an analytic service, what good it is to just have the data without doing an analytics. So the service gives you an ability to orchestrate analytics and there is a catalog where we have all of our uh, uh, algorithms and stuff. Like so who we are as a team, so uh, we are data services here, we love Go. Uh, we also love Java when we do Apex um, uh, and other systems. Um, we work on uh, distributed systems and uh, uh, big data and streaming data systems. So, if you guys have uh, if you guys have worked on similar technologies, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, Vinata, she's there somewhere out there. Okay, there she is. Okay, so I want to quickly give you a, a introduction about Predict's time series. So. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, time series, it's a service to store uh, time series data and retrieve, but uh, the, what we actually do is industrial time series are slightly different. Uh, in the sense, for example, the picture that you see on the side uh, gives you a quick uh, overview of what a time series data looks like. So there is a tag. Tags are typically sensors that you essentially uh, uh, measure uh, something. And there is a, uh, for each of the timestamp, there are two elements to it. One is the measurement itself. I mean, what do you measure and what's the quality of the data? So quality is pretty unique to uh, industrial use cases. So what quality tells us is what's the context in which the data was generated. I mean, is it a good, is it a bad one, or like what do we have to do with it when we run analytics? So, so our service kind of actually gives you ability to store all of this. Uh, there is also attributes which gives you context around what the data points are generated. So all of those are there. Uh, we do support millisecond level precision and have uh, support for strings and numbers. Okay, waiting for the screen to refresh. Okay. Okay. Let me figure out. Okay, there you go. So, um, so this is the overall architecture of uh, Predict Time Series. So there are on the left-hand side you see multiple sites uh, with like various machines. Um, uh, there are data getting generated, uh, it could be sensor information, all of those actually goes to a cloud gateway, uh, which is return on go, it's high performance, so it takes the data, all it actually does is it puts it in a distributed messaging layer. So we use Kafka here, um, uh, and, then, uh, the, and then the pipeline actually picks up the data. So the pipeline is uh, powered by uh, Apex, so we've done a bunch of changes around it, we're going to talk about what we've done and stuff like that. So eventually, uh, the data goes to our low latency columnar store, uh, that's a property store that we have, and then there is a query service that's actually reading the data off of that and sending it back. Okay, so next time I'm going to flick the button and then keep talking. <laughs> something to make me talk. Yeah, it's, it's changing here, but it just doesn't reflect. Can I ask you a question? Sure. <clears throat> One of the things that you have on your time series that I thought was missing is you normally, if you're going to do, say, batch or even continuous processing in a factory, yeah. You have to understand the machine, what the machine is, okay. the time stamp for that machine, so you can go through the process and then look at that time series, the, the time data, for each of the steps you know, that's going in between the machine. I don't want to. So when I look at your slides, I don't see where you're showing. You know, I can see when you have a, a windmill or something like that, they're not, you know, there's not a continuous process. Or, or batch process. It's just a machine that you're recording, or a jet engine, it's the same thing. But if you're going to do that in a factory, you're going to have to also have some other date, you know, information 
recorded so that you can look at this data and provide predictive maintenance or, or analytics. Absolutely. So I think there is a combination of things that was going on in the picture. One is a local analytics that actually happens on the factory itself. Like, I mean, it could be an HBase device like Predix machine that actually takes these data as it streams and then provides feedback back to them. But you do want to look at some of these assets at a very higher level. So you can basically optimize it at probably a, a wind farm level. So for those data, all those data actually goes to the Predix cloud and Predix cloud is where the analytics and that's run by uh, a data scientist probably working on and looking at each of these asset types and optimizing the asset types. So, and one other question, on one of your other slides, you go back a few, I don't know, you can't just go back. Okay, yeah. So that's what <laughs> the, the, the one slide where you said this is Predix, where you said, you know, there's like, a, is there, a, you, you showed a, is that a Predix gateway that you're talking about? Yeah, the wind farm, yeah, the windmill, there's a Predix gateway? Correct, yeah. And that Predix gateway may not send any data back up to the cloud. It may actually, so the gateway is sent down to it, right? Yeah. So the gateway is running in the cloud itself. So what happens within Predix machine is not something that we are completely covering in this talk. And this talk is more about the time series service that is available in the cloud. So the gateway that you actually saw is in the cloud itself. So there's no time series locally at the gateway. So uh, GE has uh, has a time series store called Prophecy Historian that's been there like for a couple of decades now, and it's already deployed in so many different places. So uh, that is still relevant for whatever we are doing. And there is also future work that are happening around taking predicts and putting it in a box on the site itself. So that's, that's a surprise. Okay. Uh, Anand, yeah. um, what all analytic capabilities predicts offers for the box? So the, uh, there, uh, I'm not going to go very deep around the type of algorithms that are available because there is a catalog and it actually offers a wide set of algorithms. So I think it can be helpful for anyone to actually go and look at the catalog itself. Okay, awesome. So, okay, now that this is uh, there. So this, there are a few, I mean, uh, time series supports an API uh, and the API actually offers a bunch of uh, different features. So, uh, I mean, in industrial use cases, not all the data are sent to the cloud. So, I mean, because the data are sometimes like just too heavy and sometimes they cannot be generated because they are affected by other uh, uh, other issues. So, uh, interpolation is a big thing. So, we do support interpolation. There are all standard aggregations that we support. Uh, you could filter uh, based on attributes, quality values, um, and uh, and we do support limits in order by uh, if you're looking at doing analytics. Okay, so if you want to use Predix time series, the quickest way is sign up on predix.io and then like you can create an instance and bind to a bind to an application. So that's the quickest way. So when you bind to an application, you get the credentials for accessing the time series and then you can start pumping the data. Okay, so uh, okay, so this is a quick introduction to Apache Apex itself. So uh, Apex is a streaming analytics platform, uh, stream processing platform. Uh, uh, it provides uh, even based low latency uh, processing. Um, it also does uh, some sort of windowing. Uh, we're going to talk about it more from a bookkeeping or a reconciliation standpoint. Uh, the platform itself is scalable and highly available. Uh, one of the features that I like from Apex a lot is the state management. So what you could essentially do is you could put a few more uh, properties or uh, uh, a context on the operators themselves and what Apex can automatically do is checkpoint at uh, different intervals to save the data on on a disk uh, and it can restore them back if in case one of the operator goes down so um, that's pretty cool and then uh, there is a wide set of uh, pre-built operators that are available on Malhar um, so if you have a simple application that you're building it comes pretty handy uh, this is the platform architecture for Apex okay so um, I'm gonna move to the next one by the time it comes okay so Yep. So the the pipeline is where the Apex fits in. So all of the pipeline processing that is happening uh, is is powered by Apex. So we are running it on top of everything. Yeah, correct. Uh, there are a few other things that also happen, but this is a yeah, this is a simplistic view of the of the service. Here. Okay. So uh, I'm going to press the next one before I okay. <laughs> 
So uh, what you're actually seeing here is uh, HDFS. On the, so Apex is natively running as a YARN application. So what you see on the bottom is uh, Hadoop. Uh, it uses HDFS for checkpointing, so that's where the state source, so it runs there. Uh, streaming runtime or STRAM is the uh, application master that kind of manages your application itself when you launch the streaming application. So it does uh, heartbeats between each of the operators or the processing units that is running on the streaming application and then kind of controls and manages the life cycle of it. So it went too soon, sorry. So, <laughs> sorry. So, I, uh, so on top of it was uh, streaming application. That's effectively what, uh, what we deploy. Um, so it's our application that we built. And we, uh, there is also Malha that we talked about, which is, uh, uh, which, is the open, which is the open source operator library that you can essentially utilize to build your own stuff. Uh, Data Torrent has a few other things like the management console, uh, visualization board, and a designer. Uh, from a GE's perspective, we actually only use management console, although the others might also be useful. Um, so the management console gives you ability to look at the logs across. It's a distributed application at the end of the day. So you need to be able to look at logs across multiple instances. So the management console is pretty um, useful from that perspective. Uh, the REST API on the side, which is horizontally cutting, is pretty useful too. Uh, all of our system was too quick. Okay, so uh, so the REST API, uh, what it actually does is, so for all of our automation, uh, deployment automation, um, monitoring, we use the REST APIs. So it, it comes pretty handy. This is, if you're new to stream processing, this one slide is effectively giving a quick introduction of what stream processing is. So uh, the entire picture, the rectangle that you see is called a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. And each of those nodes are operators. There is an input operator on the left-hand side, the output operator on the other side. And there are operators in between that is doing some sort of a process. Uh, so in this case, what we are doing is we are probably computing a top K, an example of a uh, top K engine uh, with a high or uh, low oil pressure. So the event reader is taking the stream, splitting the stream based on probably an engine type, and then sending it to multiple operators. Uh, these operators are probably only looking at uh, oil pressure events and probably like dropping all the other events. So what we are doing is we are then sending the data to uh, a top K operator, which let's say uses some stochastic algorithm to figure out what the top K is, and then uses that, and then the data store writer just writes the data. That's the whole idea. to go. Can we just launch it in your application? Then we can get back. Yeah. So we share the screen. Yeah. yeah. We'll just we'll stop the screen from here and then share it from the other one. So this is not the audio Real. Hello. 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 This is cool. Let's try that again. This one? Yep. Okay, so you get a different view. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. This one, right? So let's try and see better. Okay, is it better? Let me check. Check, check, check. Okay, let's let's go handle. Okay, is it okay? Okay, I think. Um, the next is a quick introduction about uh, windowing. Um, so, I mean, in the stream processing application, you need to reconcile events that have been processed by each operator or, or each operator instance. Um, so if in case of failures, you can go back and restart from where uh, you last processed. So instead of doing it at every event, because it becomes too much of overhead for the application, so what typically these systems do is they create an event window and then like operate on the window itself. So what Apex does is it actually puts a marker operator as begin window and end window, and then like sends the data um, across these operator instances. So there is also a concept of uh, an applic. Uh, I mean, checkpointing happens after like a set of uh, um, 
system, even Windows. So, um, and then, so what happens is if a particular operator goes down, what it does is it goes back to the previously checkpointed window and then starts from reprocessing all the streams. There is also application window. This is helpful for application writers, like if you build, uh, uh, let's say, a sliding window algorithm. So you could use the application window to say, I want to look at windows at these intervals. So it automatically, the platform actually lets you know when the sliding window essentially reaches, so you can do your computes and stuff. Okay, this is much better. Okay, this is a code of a simple code of how uh, a streaming application would look in Apex. So this is a um, this is a word counter. Uh, so there is a stream of lines that is coming in. Uh, another operator is just parsing each of the lines to emit words, and there is a counter operator which counts the number of unique words and then writes it to a console. So if you look at the code, I think the code is like I mean seven lines. So there is four lines for defining each of those operators. So there is like we define each one of those operators. And then the next three lines is for each of these lines, like right? the streams essentially. Begin. So it basically the first line actually says I am adding a stream for lines, uh, reading from this input operator, and then put, uh, putting it to the uh, reading from the output of this operator to the input of this operator. That's the whole idea. So why we choose Apex? So there are a few reasons. So one is uh, from an operational standpoint, uh, the yarn compatibility is pretty uh, uh, helpful for us. We already have a data lake with all the data there. Yeah. So uh, being able to reuse the compute and the nodes around it uh, is pretty uh, helpful for us. Uh, the platform is pretty uh, fault tolerant and stable. Even though it's actually a new project for Apache, it's been there in production and battle tested for a while. I think it's in 2012, right? I'm assuming. Okay. Um, so the APIs gives you a way to quickly deploy and stuff. So that that is pretty helpful for us uh, to do automation and do scannings and other stuff. Uh, all of our clusters are curbed, so that also is a pretty important thing. From a developer standpoint, I think the key things are the malhar, the the operators that are available, uh, and uh, being able to dynamically partition. For example, in Kafka's use case, right? So when you have uh, the number of Kafka partitions, I mean, if you want to dynamically increase the number of Kafka partitions, you could. And then what will the the operator there would do is it will automatically create enough instances for the Kafka operator for each of the partitions. So to process. It. So things like that. So and based on the load, also you could actually add more operator instances, so you can partition the data and add more operator instances. So that also is pretty helpful. Uh, in general, because it's a even based architecture, the performance is pretty good. Okay. So now I need to show a skimmed version of the DAG. So can we switch here? Let's switch. Okay. Let's switch. Okay. So this is a this is a subset of our uh, pipeline. So this actually gives you a few different things here. So this is an application demo application that's actually doing. So it actually has a stream source which is actually reading off of the Kafka in our case. And then there is a parser operator. I mean because we can actually have various types of data, time series data coming in with using different formats and stuff. We do have an operator which actually uh, makes a semantic sense out of the data coming in. Uh, and then there are a few operate few other operators. So one is the sync which is actually writing it to our data store. Uh, there is an error sync. If there are problems in parsing, we actually put it in another topic. Uh, there is a usage monitoring. So for us to essentially know how much data each uh, uh, consumers are uh, consuming. So uh, so that's that's like so. If you look at the console itself, it actually provides a few other information, which is pretty helpful. So you can actually see how many events are processed, what's the latency of the system itself, and how many got emitted across each of the operators and so forth. So if you go down, you can actually see here. Uh, information about each of those operator uh, instances and what they're doing. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so I'm going to keep it smaller because I have a feeling if you do it smaller, it's much faster. <laughs> okay, 
So, um, so we're going to quickly talk about partitioning strategies and how we do partitioning. So the DAG that you just saw, we'll actually talk about how we do partitioning. We want to kind of go over these. So, um, so what Apex does internally is when you construct a logic logical DAG and then like deploy the application, launch the uh, the app, uh, it goes through the DAG and figures out how many instances of each of those operators needs to be created and how it needs to be stitched. And accordingly, it goes and gets all the containers from Yarn Resource Master, and then and then deploys the operators there and then stitches them together. So uh, in this case, there is a logical DAG which actually gets the data here and does some deduction and then puts the data out. So what we are actually doing is uh, the deduction operator is running on multiple ends and so automatically Apex can essentially spray the data out and then uh, and then it can also add an operator called Unifor operator which is uh, which is kind of consolidate all these data from various operators into this one operator. So. Um, that's, help, that's helpful when you have to reduce the number of partitions to uh, like a single node. So how does team split work? So um, the simplest use case is it basically looks at the tuple uh, and then um, does a hash code on that and then uses a few bits in the in the end. Uh, it's typically a log n number of bits of the number of partitions and then figures out based on that which partition that the data has to be mapped to. It's a simple algorithm. I think fancy code. I get the question. Okay. <coughs> The difference between logical and physical DAG is only the unifier operator. So, uh, oh, it's a question. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So there are a few things going on here. So one is the reduction operator. I mean, like if you have to have a single operator running on multiple instance, so the partition automatically happens. So that's happening. The unifier operator is just a way to unify the streams down. So, um, yep. Uh, it, it's a simple use case that I've taken here to explain this. Yeah can get really crazy sometimes. So um, the uh, the hash code is one. So if you don't want to have this, use this default hash code based uh, partitioning, you could actually implement your own stream codec. Stream codec is, a, um, is an interface that you can implement and then provide a custom hash code algorithm that you could essentially use to uh, change the partitioning logic. Uh, if, you, if you don't want the the use the hash code algorithm at all, you could also write your own custom partitioner and define what your partitions are going to be, what your states that needs to be handed over to each of those partitions. So uh, the next one is the MIM partitioning. So this is this can be the same use case. For example, the same logical DAG that we saw could also be partitioned like this. So that they could be M number of input operators <laughs> going to N number of uh, the reduction operator and then like it can essentially stitch together and then do the processing. Uh, to enable this you just have to enable the config uh, the stateless partitioner to uh, uh, whatever number you want for that particular uh, operator and then it will automatically spawn those instances across containers. So the next one is going to be parallel partitioning. So in this case you could actually say I want to actually have as many deduction operators as the same as the number of input operators that actually gets created. So it, so it, what it will automatically do is it will actually look at the previous operators, see how it's stitched and accordingly create the number of instances. Um, so I think we briefly talked about unifiers. So unifiers helps to uh, combine outputs of multiple partitions into one. Uh, it can come uh, pretty handy if you are trying to unify a large volume of data and into like one operator instance where you are doing some sort of a, a, a max or a sorting or something like that. So in this case, what you can, what it can actually do is it can have multiple levels of unifiers which can actually get the stream down to really a single one. Uh, we're just talking briefly more about the custom partitioning. So an example of a place where we have used custom partitioning is okay, is actually Kafka. So what in Kafka, I mean like I actually mentioned, uh, so uh, what happens in the Kafka's use case is uh, the, the number of Kafka partitions is going to determine the number of part, uh, partitions that you're going to create. So uh, and then it can also dynamically repartition if the number of Kafka partitions actually change. So that's actually using a custom partition. So if you want to take a look at that, you can look at the Kafka uh, streaming source operator. Okay. Now I want to take this back to the UI.
the time progresses, the performance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely directly proportional. Okay, so the so this is the DAG that we looked at. So if you go to the physical DAG, so what it actually what you see here is how this logical DAG has gotten um, deployed on the instance. So if you look at this, there is a bunch of streaming source that are there. So, um, and each of those, streams, so in this case, I have a topic that has about eight partitions. So what it actually does is it has created eight operator instances, and then um, it has created equal number of parser operators uh, in the next, I mean, there is an M by N in the first case, where it basically takes the eight and then does the seven of the, of the second operator. And then there is a parallel partitioning between the parser and the time series. Thing. So kind of actually, it's a simple example, but the kind of, kind of combines all of those partitioning strategies into one. Okay, there are some questions. Okay. Um, so, uh, three threads in parallel processing, would that be three detection operators separately? Three threads in parallel processing would be three detection operators separately. I guess the question is there are three partitions. Are they, are they three different processes that are running? Correct, yeah. So, I mean, uh, so, so these things are configurable as well. So, in some cases, you do want to have it running on separate containers. So, you essentially like partition it and have them running on individual containers. But uh, if you don't want to run it as individual containers, you want to run everything locally, there is a separate mode that you can operate on. And then what it will do is it will basically switch those together in the same container. Um, uh, that might be what you want to do in many cases because uh, you're on, otherwise you're just throwing away containers to like one thing that you're doing. So I want to talk about a few problems that we encountered along the way and then like this kind of solutions that we had to come up with. So one was uh, most of the checkpointing is happening uh, at an application is tied to the application ID. Uh, an application ID is generated by Yarn. It's a Yarn's application ID. The context is around it. Um, so what happens is if in case you want to, uh, so beyond, uh, beyond uh, across upgrades, let's say you have an application uh, version one that is running and then it has checkpointed all of its in application ID one. When you actually upgrade the application and then if you have changes in your model, right, you cannot read the same state, the checkpoints that you have already done, right. So in this case, um, what we had to do is essentially take the state outside of the regular checkpointing scheme and then take it out and put it in uh, Zookeeper in some cases, in some cases HDFS. Um, so that actually helps to keep the state beyond upgrades of so uh, this is something to keep in mind because otherwise you would essentially sometimes you'll have to go back and reprocess all the old data. So it's not, that might not be what you want. The second thing was uh, Kafka source. Uh, when you originally started working, Kafka source was just committing the message and offset as committed uh, as soon as it reads the message. So it won't wait for the entire DAG to have processed the message. So what happens in that case is let's say if the DAG goes down for whatever reason, you essentially lose the message. So uh, you won't be able to go back to the message. So what we did is we have uh, we worked with um, Data Torrent and the community to actually make those fixes on the Kafka source tensor. Uh, so uh, now what uh, the Kafka source actually only comes only after the entire DAG is processed. Um, uh, what we also do is in addition to um, like checkpointing there locally, we've also taken the offset and put it in Zookeeper. So when we actually do restarts and stuff like that, we'll always go back to what we've already processed. Yes. The Kafka source No, so the, the edge has its own mechanism for doing uh, analytics. So that's actually built within Predix machine itself. So the edge after it does whatever it does on the edge, so it will send the data to the cloud. And uh, in the cloud, the first component that actually picks up the data is our gateway. There is no pipe, Apex pipeline or anything yet. So the data actually goes to our distributed message bus, only then the pipeline actually comes to the picture. So all of this happens only in the cloud. So what do you use for uh, transporting the message all the way from the edge till it hits the cloud? Do you have any kind of infrastructure there? Or? So we, uh, so the, our Predix machine actually has a store and forward mechanism. So Predix machine is something that we have built. So it has a store and forward capability built inside that. So we use that to essentially do the staging.
Okay. So the next one is uh, gracefully stopping DAG during a breath. So let's say in your DAG, one of your uh, external systems is uh, cannot handle duplicates or it's not item potent, right? Um, so in that case, and you you want to be as close to uh, being exactly once. Um, so what you have to do is so uh, what we have done over the course of all of our DAGs is in the first op the source operator that actually takes the data, we've added this mute property. So what you could actually do is before you upgrade, you could actually mute the, the source getting any data into the DAG itself. So whatever messages that are getting, cubes that are getting processed, it will completely go through the DAG and it will kind of drain. We'll give it a minute and then do the upgrade. So that way there is like all of these other systems, we don't have to worry about duplicates on these other systems. So the last one is uh, event time based processing. So uh, so the as the event is coming, there is only the event the time that we have received the message to the pipeline, right? There is no so the e the time in which the event was emitted, right? And if you're doing aggregations or any processing based on the time of the event, the event was generated. Uh, there was no out of the box solution. So what we actually did is we uh, built a, a bunch of data structures called schooling data structures that actually takes. Uh, do some state management um, uh, behind the scenes. So what you would essentially do is you would use those to essentially keep all of your uh, maps and aggregates essentially in, in memory but backed by disk and then do your processing. So if in case a particular event arrives late, you can go back there and pick up the data and then process it. So we are in the process of open sourcing that. Um, yep. Okay, so this is my uh, last slide around the key takeaways. I think uh, over the course of time, I've kind of alluded about upgradability, tolerance for failure a few different times. I think it is pretty critical in a streaming applications to just make sure. So Apex automatically takes care of situations where operators goes down because it'll know that the operator has gone down, it'll reinstantiate them in another place. Uh, but what happens if the stamp itself goes down? So there are other scenarios that you have to think through and then make sure that it's completely available. Uh, monitoring DAG for failures, yeah. So we, we have to do that. And then uh, static partitioning helps only so much. So so static part, so there are many cases where you have to do dynamic partitioning, especially in industrial cases where the loads are completely like dependent upon time, for example. So in some cases, the machines are going to send a lot of data to the cloud and all of a sudden there will be no data at all. So, and then after some time there will be more data. So you'll have to plan for that. So uh, continuous integration and uh, deployment uh, uh, automation. Again, so the APIs that Apex has is pretty handy uh, for doing all of this. Uh, performance testing and benchmarking. So, like I said, throwing new containers at uh, an operator is not a great idea because you are effectively like wasting a lot of resource. So, doing performance testing and optimizing each of those operators are pretty critical. Uh, ship and store logs. I mean, using yarn, there is yarn aggregate log aggregator, so you should use that. Yeah, the log aggregators. Uh, I mean, if you do have a data torrent uh, license, there is a console that you could essentially use and get the data out. But uh, yeah, definitely having yarn aggregator on is. Uh, Pretty important. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Pramod. I'll try to switch to the <coughs> to this other system here. Okay, so uh, thanks, Kit. So um, Venkat basically uh, showed you how, um, let's say you have a big data ingestion problem, how you basically try to solve it by uh, breaking your uh, application logic into smaller components called operators, and how you would actually scale each of these operators um, so that you can actually handle uh, data that's arriving fast um, and it lasts scale. And I think there were some questions also, uh, like about static partitioning and direct partitioning, and we'll, we'll cover that uh, in due course. So what I'm going to talk about uh, is another important aspect of, uh, of a real time or a, or a application that's um, dealing, that's going to be running continuously, is fault tolerance. Um, because you cannot shut down this application, right? Uh, your data is coming in continuously. So you have to be able to deal with failures 
And what I mean by failures is you have an application running on your Hadoop cluster, nodes may go down. You may have to take the node down for maintenance um, after several months. So in all these cases, the application should be able to recover, not lose data, or give you duplicates. This is where the fault tolerance aspect of Apex comes in. So every operator, uh, including every partition that's in your in your application, is uh, the state is automatically checkpointed um, without you doing have to do any work. And uh, state is essentially you'll see later. I'll show you some operators. Um, it's basically um, whatever uh, variables you have in your in your class or in your in your logic. Uh, it's also it's performed automatically by the engine, um, and uh, when there's a failure, uh, the engine will automatically restore the operators to the checkpoint and continue processing. And how it does that, we'll get to the next slide and what happens there. Um, also, the frequency of this uh, checkpointing is configurable per operator. Um, so essentially, by default, it's 30 seconds. So worst case, when an operator goes down, it's going to get rewinded back to an image of it 30 seconds back. Right? Suppose you want a more faster recovery or catch up to the latest, um, you may want to do a faster checkpointing interval. Also, it's asynchronous. Uh, so the checkpointing is happening. Um, you know, whenever it happen, whenever checkpointing happens, um, it also happens in the background so that uh, it doesn't affect your logic. And typically, the checkpoint operation uh, finishes really fast. Um, and uh, by default, the state itself is stored. Uh, state is stored in HDFS, um, and you can actually change that if you want. Uh, good question. Um, yes. So the buffer is configurable. Um, I'll get to that when I'm talking about the. Uh, processing semantics uh, in the next slide. Um, so the, uh, as I mentioned, the state is uh, by default stored in HDFS, but it's switchable. You can store it elsewhere. In fact, uh, we have uh, we have somebody contribute a geode um, uh, state store as well. And um, so uh, uh, as, as, as uh, Venkat was also mentioning, the along with your application, there is an application master process that Apex inserts. Okay. Okay. Maybe at the end of the slide. Okay. So uh, the there's an application master process running along with your application that's making sure all your operators are running fine, and it can detect operator failures or node failures, and uh, it is the one that will basically uh, start this process of recovery and and manage this. Um, so the way it works is. Um, if there's a node failure, uh, sometimes Hadoop will tell the application master that some node went down or some operators went down. But more often, uh, we have to be able to detect it ourselves. So we have a heartbeat mechanism that uh, happens between the operators and the application master. And uh, in this heartbeat, if you don't receive heartbeats for a certain amount of time, then we know that the operator is dead. Um, also, we use this uh, mechanism to deliver other information like stats. Um, how, how fast the operator is processing data, what's the latency it's, it's introducing to the uh, pipeline. So you can, you know, that those stats are later viewable in your monitoring console, so you can see how your individual components of your application are performing. Uh, so the buffering mechanism. Um, so when an operator is, uh, is restarted from checkpoint, um, it needs to get uh, the data from the very next point onwards, right, the very next window onwards. So um, we have an automatic buffering of data that we do in the upstream operator. That's the operator before the operator that got restarted. And uh, the data will be replayed from the exact point from that buffer. The, uh, the buffer allows actually uh, uh, piecewise uh, re quick restarts because uh, let's say an operator goes down, the entire DAG doesn't have to be reset. Um, only the operator and its downstream operators need to be reset to the checkpoint. Uh, the buffering allows that. Also, uh, it helps in giving overall higher throughput uh, because uh, when you have two operators and uh, you know both are running on different machines, different process, uh, the buffer allow, uh, you know buffering mechanism allows for a smoothening of the uh, you know vagaries of the network 
and uh, you know the processing speeds and so on. And also uh, the application master, which is uh, a single a single um, single entity, uh, it can also go down, right? It's, it's just running like any other kind of container in your system. So uh, we we checkpoint the state of the master as well. Um, in case it goes down, uh, Hadoop only restarts the master, and that's it. Uh, after that, it doesn't do. It's, it's up to you. So then the application master will recover its state. It'll also check if any of the containers, operator containers, are down and recover them as well. So, um, so essentially, yeah, fault tolerance is as important as scalability for us. So uh, we give a lot of thought to it and make sure that. Uh, so how do you uh, ensure there is no data Yes. So uh, I'll talk about that in the next uh, slide. Yes. Question. Uh, What's the difference between operator state and application master state? So operator state is uh, it, that's is basically state that's uh, pertaining to your logic. So for example, if you have an operator that's doing unique, uh, I mean, let's say counts, it's the it's the total counts uh, that you're keeping in memory. Um, or if you're a Kafka operator that's reading from a queue, it's the offset. Uh, application master state is actually um, you know what are the current operators that are running, or how many partitions, um, you know, the, the entire plan. The entire graph of the application, uh, so that in case of the operators goes down, it can it can recover them. Can we have a store other than HDFS? Yes, you can. Uh, it's a pluggable interface, and we already have other implementations like Geo. Anything else? Okay, so processing semantics. So, like I mentioned, uh, when an operator fails um, and it's recovered. Um, it restarts at an earlier checkpoint, and it gets data immediately, um, immediate window after the checkpoint, which means it's actually a rewind, right? So your operator is going back a little bit, and it's uh, getting data from that point. So this is called at least once. Um, not not that it got the same data again in the same run, but uh, basically on a, on a recovery. And actually, uh, uh, so no messages are lost, but it still doesn't solve the duplicate problem. I'll come to that. Uh, but and this actually this mechanism is is okay for most applications. It's um, this will do. And uh, what we do is uh, we use the state recovery along with some clever uh, clever logic in the operators to achieve end-to-end -end exactly once. So uh, let me give you an example. Right? Let's say you have an uh, let's say your output operator is writing to a file, okay? and uh, when it fails. Uh, so in its state, it stores the offset. So um, let's say it failed at some point of time, um, and it got restarted at an earlier checkpoint. It because of the stateful recovery, the the platform will recover the offset, what the file was at the checkpoint. So the operator will immediately truncate the file to that offset, and then a new data comes in, it just starts writing it. So there's no duplicate. Suppose we have the uh, we have, a, we have a, for example, a JDBC operator. So the JDBC operator, what it does is it um, writes the data in a window in a transaction. So any window, um, any partial windows where it failed, that data is not yet committed because the commit happens at the end window. And all, and what also what it does is it stores the last fully processed window ID in a meta table. So on recovery, um, all the fully processed windows from the checkpoint it will ignore because it's reads that window ID back from the database. Right? So, um, so we have various mechanisms like that where the um, operator along with the platform at stateful recovery guarantees exactly once. Because uh, for end-to-end -end exactly once, the external store is also involved and it requires the operator to work together with the platform to achieve that. And we have uh, many operators in our library which do that. Okay. Do we have any interactive shells? Uh, we have a CLI tool, uh, uh, it's called Apex now, uh, with which you can uh, you know, launch applications, you can query the state of a running application. You can even make changes to the DAC as the application is running. Uh, you can add operators and streams, um, and it's full of a whole host of commands. Um, I hope that is what the caller is looking for. Question or something. Question: Can you show us example code as to what is contained in the data information? I will. I will actually try to build an application from scratch. Um, and then we can.
get into rooms for them. Yes. Yeah. How small of the footprint do you run or do you see the clients running it, let's say, what if we want to run it right on the window <coughs> without taking the uh, from the edge of the network all the way to the gates? What if we have let's say hundred gigabytes of data per, I don't know, per hour, per minute, mm -hmm. right, and we want to apply it to, let's say, short windowing, uh, how small or large do you see this, uh, the, the environment to be on the edge of the gateway? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the uh, Because of the application, um, we need a, I mean, there's a fixed cost to it. There's an application master that's always running that requires that amount of memory. Uh, we recommend at least one GB, right? And then your operators can be uh, as small as, you know, as, you know, just based on what logic you have in your operators. So we have seen, uh, you know, people have operators as small as, uh, you know, 256 MB uh, RAM and uh, based on how much how much logic you have, you know, you could have, uh, we would have an application running in 2 GB overall, 3 GB. Yeah. And when it comes to the compute or GPUs, like mm -hmm. what would you describe like uh, the smallest feasible, in your opinion, a uh, piece of hardware that exists in the market, mm -hmm. but powerful enough to run Apex on the edge? Well, my experience, uh, I think the smallest one I've run is on my laptop. <laughs> so, I don't know if anybody else has a better uh, answer to that. Um, so, with uh, AGP RAM and, you know, general uh, quad-core CPU, again, that's sweet. Okay. So something like a uh, size of the phone, but it has 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM would be plenty to yeah. to process small watches in, in real time. Right? Yeah. So small streams. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. One more question. Yeah. Uh, is Java the only alternative dynamic script allowed? So if you want to harness the full power of the platform and basically write any logic and any operator you want, yes, uh, Java would be the way. However, you know, as you know, write um, code compatible languages will automatically work. So if you use Scala or something, that will work. Uh, we do support certain script operators like uh, Python and uh, R and JavaScript and so on, but the support is limited, so you can only do certain things in those operators. So at least right now. Any other questions? Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so we, talk, we saw uh, at least once and how at least once uh, along with um, the, uh, you know, with the state recovery and, uh, and, and operator uh, logic can be used to achieve it exactly once and to an exactly once. Uh, we support another mode called at most once, um, which is essentially if you don't care about data loss um, uh, as, uh, on a failure, uh, you just want to just, when you recover, just start processing the latest data. Uh, some applications might be okay with that. Um, you could use this mode, in which case when the operator restarts from the checkpoint, uh, it doesn't immediately get the window after the checkpoint, but it just gets the latest data. Okay. Uh, we also support, support another mode called window exactly once. Uh, this is actually just a convenience on top of at least once, where essentially the checkpoint happens every window. So uh, it's a little bit more overhead. Um, but uh, in certain cases, this could be used uh, to get uh, exactly once more easy. Okay, so next is uh, stream locality. Um, this essentially is uh, how you place your operators. So by default, when you don't do anything, on the previous slide, in what instances can at most one be valuable? Well, let's say you are um, you are you you're computing something and you are just visualizing the output. You're not, you know, you don't care about historic values. You don't need the, the results to be exactly correct. You're just looking at the latest trends. You just care about the latest data. You could use this um, because you're a human looking at the dashboard, right? And you really don't care about all this stuff. Next question is, do you have SQL? SQL, uh, yeah, that's a question that comes up. <laughs> so we do have, uh, well, it's in our roadmap. And uh, we have some JIRAs in our Apex where people are trying to uh, take existing SQL engines and uh, port them to run on top of Apex, something like CalSite. So that's uh, in the works. Okay, <clears throat> so 
Um, so what happens when, uh, when you just deploy your application? So the operators um, just are located randomly on, on different Hadoop nodes and they run as different processes. Uh, this is essentially whatever containers or processes Hadoop gives us, we will just deploy in there. But uh, you, can, you can determine the destiny a little bit more if you want to. So you can, for example, uh, tag certain operators as rack local. So what it means is um, these are the operators that are connected together and you, you basically say, you, you, you basically term them as rack local. Then uh, we try to uh, ask Hadoop to give us containers in the same rack. So the advantage is your data is going to remain in the same network and uh, won't travel switches. Uh, we support node local as well. So essentially we are, in this case, the operators will be on the same sheet. Um, so this will basically, so when they're communicating with each other, the data is just going over the local network stack and not on your, uh, on your network, physical network. So it doesn't affect other nodes. And then the next two are actually something that we support. Uh, Hadoop doesn't necessarily provide you that. So in container local, um, we are actually running the operators as two threads, um, a separate threads inside the same process. So we just get one container and then uh, we run the operators inside the same container and then the data is exchanged via a queue. So this is faster because uh, the data doesn't need to be serialized. So one thing is we allow any type of uh, the operators to be able, operators can send any type of data they want. So it could be any Java object. So um, you know if it's a uh, if it's a complex object, it need to be serialized. Thread local is uh, another interesting uh, locality. So in this case, the operators are running in a single thread. Um, so it's it's basically the it's like taking the output of one operator and calling the next operator, sending it to the next operator in the same function. Um, so in this case, uh, basically there is no queue involved either. Um, this is useful in when you have one operator that uh, rarely gets used. Uh, so suppose you have an operator that sends, let's say suppose an op there's an operator that actually uh, is doing alerting. So it's basically looking for alert conditions. And then there's another operator that sends an email when, 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 there's an, when, the, when the alert condition is true. So most of the time the alert condition is not true. Uh, so the first operator is actually doing the work, it's checking. The second operator that actually sends the mail is rarely activated, right? So you put them in thread local, and you have the same process, uh, and you're not using a lot of resources. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the uh, the operators are, uh, I mean, the communication is over the network, so I don't necessarily understand FIFO, FIFO, but. I'm, I'm assuming it's, yeah, I don't think it makes any sense. But it's, it's networking, uh, all the networking is being handled by Apex. So operators just emit data and the other operators just get the data. Um, and everything in between is handled by Apex. Uh, next question, what is a good network bandwidth so that it doesn't freeze up? It depends on the application. Uh, typical, you have seen, we don't require any exorbitant, any high network, uh, speeds or anything like that. We have had people use 10 gigi, 200 gigi, so. Um, right. Um, so just a slide on, um, on how, do you, how do you launch an application? How, what, what, what is it, in, what is this thing involved? So typically you would install um, Apex on uh, one node in a cluster, that's all it takes, uh, just one node. Uh, it can be a node in a cluster, uh, that's already uh, part of, it can be Hadoop node or it could be just be an edge node. And uh, from here you can launch your application and it gets deployed onto the cluster. Uh, so when you launch an application, you have two choices. I mean, if you're using Apex, you have a, we have a command line tool. Uh, Data Torrent, we, we have an enterprise edition of Apex that we provide, uh, which she's using. Um, and uh, there we have a UI monitoring tool and we have a whole bunch of things uh, where you can just launch from the, from the monitoring tool itself. Um, so uh, what happens when you launch an application, right? So uh, your DAG, um, uh, this entire application gets assembled on the client. Um, then it along with all the, uh, your application jars and other dependency jars, everything gets pushed into HDFS and then the first process gets started, which is the application master. 
then the application master um, gets the uh, decentralized your, your your application plan. That, that is what we call the logical plan. So this is the application as you built it. Um, then it's, it proceeds to convert it to what is called a physical plan. This is the place where it's trying to figure out how many partitions are needed and so on. There are two ways you can do static partitioning. So you can fix how many partitions you want for each operator, or you can do something called dynamic partitioning. Um, uh, essentially, dynamic partitioning, you can, we have some dynamic partitioners that you can use. We actually made that an API as well, so you can implement your own dynamic partitioning if you wanted. For example, the Kafka operator does that. Uh, what it does is it looks at the number of partitions on the Kafka side that are available for a topic and creates as many number of partitions on the Apex side. If you are in a one-to-one -one mode, it also supports uh, many-to-one. Uh, yeah, so so basically the so the, uh, the static or the dynamic partitioning uh, partitions are called. The um, all the partitions are are computed, and at this point we have what is called the physical plan. Then the application master proceeds to talk to Hadoop, get the containers to run these, um, and then it before it does that, before it actually runs your application, it proceeds to look at your locality. What operators do you want to actually put together on the same node? same container, same thread, and all those things. And then it comes up with what is called an execution plan. And this is the execution plan is what's eventually reflected um, on the network, on, on the cluster. And all this is happening internally. And then each uh, operator, and it's, I mean, the operators that are when they're launched over the network, uh, they run in a process called streaming container, which is, which is an, uh, a clue code in Apex. It's like a management code in Apex that's running your operator so that it's handling all the networking and your life cycle and so on, and uh, and your operator just gets the data, does whatever it needs to do and sends the data out. Okay, any questions? Too much info? All right. Uh, next, uh, let's look at the Kafka operator because this is an important operator when it comes to streaming applications, uh, streaming ingestion. Um, Kafka is becoming very popular, um, if it isn't already. And uh, we have first class support for Kafka. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the operators we, we, we test a lot. You know, we, you know, as I said, we do dynamic partitioning, you know, um, and, and fault tolerance, all those aspects are really thoroughly tested and benchmarked. So, um, we support both uh, high and low level API. Uh, we also support the new 0.9 API of Kafka. Um, we, uh, we support uh, allow you, we also allow you to store, we do offset control offset management internally or automatically so if the operator dies um, it will recover it will know its last offset and, and you know get the data exactly from where it left off um, but if you wanted to store offset outside like the case that Venkat was mentioning where you want to be able to upgrade your application code and still continue from where you left off um, you know uh, we allow that as well. We support one-to-one, one-to-many partition strategy. One-to-one is we create as many Kafka uh, Apex Kafka partitions as as there are on the on the Kafka side. One-to-many is we can have one Apex partition read from multiple Kafka partitions, um, and then we can uh, you can control you can do throughput control. Um, you know uh, how many messages if you want if you want basically uh, threshold it by the number of messages to read per second or size of messages you could do that. As I mentioned, it's it's uh, it's fault all right. Yeah. What is the entry point where that gets assembled on the client side? Yeah. So um, it's it's a, a Java. It's basically a, you basically when you're writing your applications, you're using the API, and the API requires you to implement uh, a, a class called implements implement the streaming application interface. Um, there was a slide earlier in the deck uh, which showed that. Uh, and uh, when I try to build an application next, you'll see that as well. That's the entry point, yes. Okay. Uh, so debugging, um, so one of the things uh, we basically, when we were designing Apex, excuse me, we wanted to make sure that uh, this doesn't look like a black box, right? Uh, this would be, we know that this would applications are tough, and uh, we know that it, you know, there's a lot of, uh, sometimes there's performance tuning involved, sometimes, you know, you make mistakes uh, writing applications, and you want to know uh, where the mistake is. 
so we wanted to make sure it's highly operable um, from the get go. Um, so what we do is we support a lot of different things that help you debugging. First thing is um, when you're building this application, you can uh, first test it locally uh, as is in your in your IDE um, or you know what your local environment is even before you deploy it on the cluster without changing the application. Of course, it means that if you're talking to external servers and so on, those are accessible from your local machine, but you can run it in, in a local mode. So if you're running it in an IDE, you can uh, you can you know, do your full Java debugging, um, breakpoints and watches and so on. Um, next, um, we also um, uh, use the YARN uh, logging mechanisms. Uh, so our logs for the containers and the operators go to the exact places um, where, uh, for example, the Hadoop logs for the container would go. So, uh, and in, uh, in the UI, if you're using data torrent, you can you access, you directly have access to the logs. So every container, you can just uh, pull up the logs right there, and you can look at problems and exceptions and, and other things um, right there. And you can also change the log level dynamically. So that was something that we added uh, you know, recently. Um, uh, of course, you can also, if you're using log aggregation and if your application's ended, you can you can use the YARN, YARN logs to get it. So that's where I said, you know, we write the logs in, in such a play, in such a way that you know they get they they just look like any other YARN logs, and they are collected by the by the YARN log aggregation. And um, yeah, so uh, and then we as you know we provide logs for at, at all the different for all the different components for the individual containers for the application master. So so that you can uh, easily um, find the problems and debug them. And uh, I think most recently we've also added uh, the way to get uh, stack jumps and so on for the individual containers. Okay, so at this point, uh, we are in demo mode. Any questions? <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, I'll let, um, do you have any demo to show? Just Right. Okay, so I'll go with uh, building an application. Now, uh, what I wanted to do was just show you how quickly you could, let's say you wanted to build an ingestion type application, uh, how quickly you could do that from scratch. Um, before I do that, uh, just to get a gauge of the audience, so how many of you here are Java developers, where Java developers, pretend to be Java developers? <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I think I'll, yeah, I'll, I think it'll be good for, uh, I'll, I'll try to make it so that it's still, everybody can understand and follow. And uh, if I'm going to leap and if, some, if somebody thinks it's, it's getting difficult to understand, let me know, okay? Really? Yeah, It'll be difficult for me to type. In. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise the ID will just go nuts. this year. See the screen. Let me make sure that uh, folks <coughs> remotely also can see the screen. Okay. 
and this is it. We do need this in uh, more. Okay. So just to make this uh, this demo a little smoother, I created myself a cheat sheet, and I'm going to use that. Because if I were to type in look for stuff and type in commands, you probably get bored. Okay. So, um, so the first thing is uh, to get anyone started in building an application, um, we provide a very easy tool that you can use to just generate a very basic template application. And uh, so you can just run that, get your template application, and, get, and you can just make your modifications from there and get going. So if, if uh, any of the folks are familiar with Maven, it's actually a Maven archetype, but for practical purposes, that's okay. So I'm going to actually change these names a little bit. I'm going to call it, say, data turned, data app. Don't worry if you full, don't fully understand this. All I'm doing is giving my application a name. Uh, yes? I think that would be a good question for Venkat. Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Yes, answer is yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm just running this uh, this archetype. Um, yes, I can do that most definitely. Bigger. Right. How about now? Very good, right? Okay, so uh, all right, so I'm just going to say yes, and now it generated a, an application called Meetup App. You see here, it creates a folder. It's very difficult to see. It generates Meetup App. So uh, now you can load this app in your favorite IDE. Uh, I just use IntelliJ. Uh, you could use any anything you like. Um, all the all the all the uh, IDEs understand Maven now. So okay. need to find the folder first. You can do this good. So I already loaded the, the sample application uh, that got generated and it has this following structure um, where you can actually see the a, 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 a default application got created and this application actually has two operators. Uh, so somebody is asking what's the entry point, so this is the entry point. So you define a class, you give it whatever name you want, it just needs to implement streaming application which is an API. So this particular application, we have two operators, a random number generator and console output. And they are just being connected together with to this add stream command. So all it's doing is we're going to gen uh, the first one is going to just generate random numbers. And the second one is just going to output the random numbers to a screen. Uh, when you're running this on a cluster, this whatever you're going to output to the screen will actually go to a log file. So, uh, as I mentioned, you can actually test your application right here even before launching on Hadoop. So uh, to do that, we provide you some uh, some test code already that you can use. So if you go to the test folder, you can see an application test. Uh, all it's doing is actually running the same application here that you have here, right? Um, in, in what is called a local mode, so just setting up local mode and, and basically passing the same application. And I can just right click it here and just run it. So you'll see that as it runs, uh, you know, the original intent of this application will come through. So it's basically uh, printing some random numbers with the, with the prefix, right, hello world. Not very interesting, but just to show, you know, this is basically meant to be a hello world. Like this is the first application. You know, somebody would show it there. They're showing something. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and, uh, and change this application to do something useful, like maybe ingesting data from Kafka, right? So to do that, um, I'll start making some changes. First, um, I'll give 
this application some interesting name, maybe a meetup application. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah. I always forget to do that. And it's not very really straightforward this thing, but I think it's it this. Yeah. yeah, this thing will not, what it does, maybe, okay. What it does, it doesn't let me, yeah, it doesn't let me do that. Okay, it's better? Okay. So, um, yeah, so we get this in description, we'll give it up some name as well, call it my meetup app. Uh, then what we'll do is uh, we'll now import the Kafka operator that we already provide in the library that you can readily use. You don't have to write one from scratch. So to do that, I'll go to the name and build file and include uh, include that dependency. Again, I'll, I'll refer to my little cheat sheet to add the dependencies. Um, so what I'm also going to do is eventually write some data to MySQL. So I'm also going to include the MySQL dependencies. So I'll do all that in one shot instead of uh, trying to do it multiple times. So this is standard Maven stuff. Don't worry about it. Okay, so I'm going to basically add my dependency here. I'm going to use a new version of the library as well. Okay, so I added MySQL. I added uh, Kafka. I added uh, the, uh, our, our Kafka operators and I took a new version of the library. <coughs> cool. So now I'll delete the old application because I no longer need it. And I'll start building one application. So the first thing we'll do is we'll read data from Kafka. So I'll add a Kafka operator. So once you add your dependencies, um, your IDs are smart enough to find uh, the operators right from the library. So at this point, um, I'm using uh, give me a second. Yeah. Trying to adjust the audio. Trying to adjust the audio a little bit. Okay. okay. All right. So um, I'm going to add the the Kafka operator. I'm getting a little bit of echo, sorry. Okay, so I'll give it a friendly name. I'll just call it input. So this is how you add your operator to the DAG. You just call the add operator method. Um, so when you implement streaming application, just need to implement one method, populate DAG, and you're given an empty DAG. So DAG is a direct acyclic graph. Um, just think of it as a way to build your pipeline. You start with an empty pipeline. You're adding your first operator, which is Kafka. So essentially, you're going to read data from Kafka. So I'm going to read the, the data in, in, in line format, and this is going to output line by line. That's why this uh, string input operator. There are other forms also. You can do byte arrays and so on. Um, for this, we'll just keep it simple. Uh, next, we'll basically parse this line, break it into words, right? So, so I need a parser. So let's build one parser operator from scratch. So here, I'll delete this random number generator because I no longer need it. That was a remnant of the of the template application. So I'll go ahead and create a parser. So it'll be a very simple operator. All it's going to do is it's going to get a, the lines of text. It's going to break them into words. So to start building an operator, you basically extend this operator. And then um, if you want to get data in, you'll add what are called input ports. And if you want to send data out, you add what are called output ports. And then you'll use these input ports and output ports in your application to connect the operators. Right? And uh, Apex takes care of you know, getting the data to the input ports and taking the data out of output ports. 
So again, these are just uh, notional ports, right? These are not physical ports or network ports or anything like that. So I'll create an input port that's going to take a string So at this point, um, the ID is smart enough to realize that I need to actually implement a method process. So um, as soon as data arrives to you, into your operator, the process method will get called with the data. Right? So Apex by itself does not delay, it does not introduce artificial delays. So there's no batching or anything. The, the, the processing is truly event by event. So you get the event as soon as it's available um, and you can act on it. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to parse the word, break the word in, break this line into words and then output the individual words. So I'm going to use the stand, I'm going to basically split the words, um, split the line at uh, punctuations and, and, and word boundaries, right, spaces. So to do that, I'm not going to do any hard work, but I'm going to use a regular expression and I'll cheat once again. I'll just, I already have the regular expression that I'm going to copy because I'm not very good at it. Okay, so essentially this uh, breaks the line at uh, punctuation boundaries and spaces and so on. And if there's any uh, regular expression gurus in this crowd, you can verify if that's correct or not. So now uh, we want to basically, so essentially we broke the string into words. We got an array of, word, array of words and then um, we're going to send each of the word out. So we're just looping through that array and we're going to send it out. So how do we send it out? To send, send it out, you use what is called an output port. So you let's declare an output port. That's all it takes. Uh, you declare input and output ports. You can have more than more than one input and more than one output ports, and you determine the destiny of the data. Okay. So at this point, um, I have the output port. So I'm going to actually emit these words on the output port. Okay. So that's it, I have a parser operator. So if you look at our library, uh, you'll find more, more sophisticated parsers. You'll find CSV parser, JSON parsers, and all that, Avro, Parquet. Um, this one's probably as simple as it gets. So I'm now going to create an inst so I'm going to add a parser operator to the DAG. I'm going to give some name. So now that I have the two operators, I'm going to connect them. So I'm going to take the output of Kafka, connect it to the input of parser. That's where the ports come in, right? So I'm going to give, so when you connect the, the operators, um, we call it a stream. So you give the stream a name. So I'm calling it lines. I'm going to take the output of the Kafka, connect it to the input of the parser. Okay, so, we've, so now we have parsed output, right? So now let's do something that in ingestion we probably frequently do, like filtering. Right? So let's do some filtering. So what I'm going to do is all words starting with A, I'm going to drop, right? Because I don't like those words, maybe. So <laughs> uh, I'm going to create a filter. Again, I'm going to do the same song and dance. So I'll, I'll just copy the code quickly from here, so I'm not typing everything and putting, sending you guys to sleep. So I'll just come here. So we'll do it do slightly different here. So here, as, as, essentially, as soon as we get a string, it's actually the word, right? So what I'm going to do here is when I see the word, I'm going I'm going to drop it if it starts with a. Otherwise, I'm going to send it, right? So so this is what I'm going to do. So if it doesn't start with a, I'm going to emit the word. Otherwise, I won't do anything. That's the same as dropping it. Right? So, probably the simplest operator I wrote. So, I'm going to create a filter. And I'm going to connect the output of the parser, just let's say words, to the input of the filter, right? Okay, next, let's do some basic analytics, right? So you do filtering, you typically sometimes do enrichment. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. Um, analytics, let's count the, Let's count how many times each word occurs. That's a kind of an aggregate. Sometimes you do more complex aggregates like dimensional analytics and so on, and we do have operators for that. 
So I'll create a counter, which essentially is going to count words, or count the, how many times each word occurred. And uh, I'll actually uh, show you how to, actually you can, you can you, here you're just counting things, right? So it doesn't have to be strings, it could be numbers, it could be anything. So I'll make it generic, I'll use generics so that the same counter operator could be used for counting many different types of uh, types of entities. So I'm just going to use Java generics. It's like, uh, I heard it's like C++ templates. Okay. So what are we going to do here, right? Here essentially, um, whenever, when, when we get the words, um, we're going to count, we're going to keep a count of how many times that word occurred. And, uh, and then periodically emit those counts because when the application is running continuously, you periodically want to know what those counts are. It's streaming application, it's not, it's not going to end. So to do that, I'll actually keep a count of the current count of every, every word, right? I'll keep it in a map. So I'll store the, the counts in a map, hash map. This one. <laughs> Oops. Apologize. Okay. So this is my current counter count values. So I'm going to keep them in there. So this is also going to show you uh, state, right? How state is going to, how state is being used. So these uh, these counts are actually the the state of your uh, of your app, of this particular operator. These counts are not going to go away. So even if your operator dies and comes back, the counts are going to come back. Okay, so that's important. So we're not going to clear the counts. Just keep going. So just call it. I have to call it tuple. You can call it I think. So. So when a new word arrives, what are we going to do? We're going to look at the current count incremented, right? So we're going to get the count. And the very first time this count will not be there. So we'll create a new count at that point when it's not there. When the very first time we see the word, standard boilerplate Java code. Okay, and then we'll basically increment the count. So here, next we'll use a notion of window, right? So now you're, you're basically, whenever data is arriving, you're not emitting anything. You're just counting how many times it arrives. And uh, periodically, we want to basically send those counts out. Uh, so in, in Apex, as I think I was showing, uh, you have the notion of an application window. So each operator can define an application window. And at the end of the application window, which is basically time-based, uh, default is fine in milliseconds, you can change that. Um, you get a callback and you can do something in that callback. So that's the end of the window callback. Uh, so in this case, at the end of the window, I'm going to emit those counts. Okay, so at this point, I'll just look through the, through the map and I'm going to emit those counts. Again, I need an output port, and I'm going to output it as a key value pair. Each key value pair is going to contain the word and its count. So it's like a key and a value. So I'm looping through here and I'm going to use, I'm going to emit the, to create a key value pair out of these, uh, out of, uh, with, the, with the word and its count. Okay, and I'm going to emit that, right? Um, now what's going to happen is, let's say there is no data come uh, at all, let's say, uh, but the counts are built up, then, uh, 
and the window will keep getting called and, and it will still emit the counts even though there is no change. So for that, I will basically make a small change so that we are not emitting anything when there is no data. So I'll use a variable called available. So whenever data comes in, I'm going to set available to true. And at the end of the window, only when something, only when the counts have actually changed, when there was some data had arrived, I'm actually going to do the emitting. Right. Otherwise, I'm not. And then I also reset the variable. Right. So if no data arrives, it's not going to send anything. So I think the dreary part is almost over. So you can relax a little bit. So I'm going to. There is just one more, but that's that's simple. If I've done things right. So I'm going to add the counter operator as well. Okay, and then we're going to connect the output of the filter. to the input of the counter. And then what do we do with the outputs of the count? Or what do we do with the counts, right? Now we have the counts. So let's store that in a SQL database, in a MySQL database, right? So for that, we already provide an operator to do that. Um, however, um, we give you the control to choose your schema, right? Um, you can have your own database schema, and all you need to do is map what um, fields in this key value pair go to what columns in the database. Uh, the rest is handled, all the JDBC stuff is handled. That will extend the operator that's already available in the in our library, which is this one. And you have to specify what, uh, what input it takes, which is key value pair of string and integer, right? So each word and its count, that's what's coming in. And uh, the ID tells me that I need to implement some methods. I'm going to ask it to generate those. So at this point, it's all, all, all it's asking is what's the SQL? Um, what's the SQL command I need to run? And how would you set the, the, uh, the data on the, on, the, on the prepared statement? The SQL prepared statement. So if you've done JDBC coding, this is natural. So um, for this, I'm going to do an upsert into the into the MySQL database. So I'm just going to I kept my, I basically have this SQL already here. So I'm just going to use it. So all it's doing is it's inserting into a word count table the word and the count. So just two columns, word and the count. But if the count's already there, it's just going to overwrite it. If it's not there, it's going to insert it. That's where the upset is. Right? Um, this is because we are just going to you know, keep sending the, uh, we're going to keep the old counts and keep just sending the cumulative counts. Right? And uh, every time when a tuple arrives, so this basically let, makes the JDBC operator create a prepared statement. And, uh, and then when a new data arrives, we just need to set the values of the prepared statement. So um, because there are only two, two columns, two values, the first thing is a string, so we'll set this, and uh, which is the key. <coughs> and uh, in JDBC, the numbering starts from one, so that's why it is one. And the second one's a value, which is an integer. So, okay, that's it. So, and then we'll add this, and we're done with the application. And then we'll add the output of the counter. Count to the input of the JDBC operator. Right, that's it. So here you have an application. You have five operators, and you have you have successfully created it. Now we need a few properties. So we need to know where the Kafka server is. We need to know where the um, database server is, and so on. So I'll go to the properties XML, which is here, and I'll just set those properties. And so I'm going to remove these old properties for the template application. And I'm going to set the, the, uh, the Kafka and the other properties. <coughs> OK. 
here. So let's see what these properties are, right? So first, I'm say I'm basically um, as you when you are adding these operators, you give them some friendly names, right? Like input. So the Kafka operator has a property called topic, which is this topic, and zookeeper server is the is the location of the zookeeper server for Kafka. So I'm basically setting those two values here. I'm setting the topic property for the input operator, the zookeeper. I'm setting those for the output, which is the JDBC. I'm setting the database driver and the database URL, and so which is I just call it output. Yeah. And there's one more interesting thing. So for this parser, I'm actually going to create more than one partition. I'm actually going to create four partitions. So this is how you'd create four partitions for the Kafka for the parser to start with. Because typically the parsers are doing the heavy work, right? The input operator is just getting data from input which is streaming in, but it's not doing much processing. And because Kafka uh, operator is dynamically partitioned and it will basically create as many number of partitions as there are Kafka uh, on the Kafka side. Uh, and I actually have a topic that I'm connecting to which is meet up here actually has two partitions. You'll see that there are two Kafka partitions created and the four parser partitions created. So now that the application is done, um, all you need to do is build it. Uh, you run this Maven standard build command and skip this, being a good programmer that you are. Um, so if it's successful, um, it's going to create a file. Uh, it's going to create an app package, um, a single file called it's going to create this file with an extension .apa. So this file basically contains all your code, all the dependencies, all your properties, everything in one package. In the, in the web world, it's the analogous to war file, right? You have war file in the web world. It's kind of like that. So now you can take this and deploy it in the cluster, right? Just one file, easy to carry, just deploy. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect to my lab. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so this one's not dynamically partitioning, so it is, it's going to be fixed. But if you have a dynamic partitioner, um, you can you can have uh, you do have partitioners which have a maximum minimum and a maximum. Uh, so and it'll, they'll only scale up to the maximum. When it's reached, they'll, they'll stop scaling. So okay, so I'm going to connect to our cluster here. And I'm going to show the monitoring console. So this is our, this is the data torrent um, enterprise edition uh, monitoring console um, that you get. Uh, and in here, you can you can use this tool to uh, to launch and visualize in your applications and so on. So I'll first upload our application that we created. So so we were in Meetup app. From the right folder, yeah. Target and APA file. So now it's uploading the application. So right now, um, Node Zero is one of our nodes in a cluster, and that's where our you know data torrent is installed, and this particular console is running. As I said, you just need to install it on one machine. From there, this application is going to get launched on the cluster. So we uploaded it, and uh, here it is, and I'm going to launch it. Okay. So it's launched. It gives you an application ID. This I think somebody asked who assigns this ID. This ID comes from directly from Jan Hadoop. So. And at this point, we are getting the containers. We are starting the containers, and. Uh, if I did this right, you'll see your five operators. So input, parser, filter, counter, output. All of them have started, right? Uh, everything's green here. On the right side, you can see the, what are all the major um, events that happened. If things went down, you'd see them here. See the overall memory being used, total containers. And this is what we call the logical plan, like I said, the application as you built it. Uh, now I'll go into the physical tag view and you'll actually see the partitions for each. So as I said, there were two Kafka partitions, right? So two input partitions got created and then we created four parser partitions manually. So you see, you see four and then... So uh, in dynamic partitioning, uh, you implement uh, something called a partitioner and the partitioner um, 
you can look at the API, uh, but suffice to say, uh, the partitioner has control of uh, what the old partitioner partitions are and what are the new partitions it wants to return. Um, and uh, I think yeah, I think there's some, uh, there's some examples you can find. Um, so Kafka operator is one that basically implements dynamic partitioner. Uh, so does uh, we have a dynamic partitioner that you can use generically for different kinds of applications. It's it's called throughput based partitioner, which dynamically partitions based on throughput. So now that we have this DAG, let's actually send some data and see if we actually got the counts. So I'll go back to the logical, and I'm going to use the okay, node 29. So before that, I'll connect to node 28 where I have my MySQL database and make sure that there's nothing in the database so that we can see new data come up. Yes. Huh? Okay, fonts. Sorry. Okay. Better? Okay, so I have a table here called meetup. I'm bad with names, so I call everything meetup. And then word count. Okay, there's some data already, so I must have done it before. So I'm just going to delete from word count, so it's empty. Okay. So now I'm going to send some data to Kafka. So I have a little bit, little small, um, so I have a small script here. All it's using is it's using the Kafka command line script, uh, which you get from the Kafka installation to connect to the Kafka server and send some file. Um, and I'm basically sending the license file of Kafka itself, so I'll just count the words in the license file. <laughs> <laughs> so as I send this file, uh, you should see data come in, uh, and, and everything should be okay if we did it right. So run it. Okay, you see data come in, it's going through a pipeline, it's processing. No failures here, if you see failures here, then then you're going to stay here longer. <laughs> so it's done. Um, let's go and look into the into this table here. See, if, okay, there you go. We got all the word counts, right? So yeah, that's how easy or difficult as you think is to build a pipeline. Um, we also are coming up with a higher level API that's in the works which basically make writing all these operators and connecting them easier. It flows more like a, like a functional syntax, like A dot B dot C kind of thing. If you're interested, you can look it up. And uh, yeah, follow Apex. <laughs> Should I change my uh, configuration from external? From? From external, we don't, we don't need to do application again and again. Yes, yes, so if when you're launching the application here, you can specify a configuration file so here when I was launching it, right, I do have the option to use different configuration files and specify custom properties right here. Okay, so you can be different from what the developer gave you. Yeah. Uh, Note going down, uh, you having, uh, for example, you are using up too much memory than what you asked for. Maybe there's a bug in your program, your, your memory is growing. Um, and uh, or maybe you you mis under misestimated how much memory you need, uh, you know how much resources you need um, because all those are settings you can you can configure them uh, you can change it. So those are some of the common reasons. The other other reason also is um, you may have a, a really fast operator and uh, then you have an operator that's really slow. Then you'll see that and then the the, the difference between the, the gap between the operators are increasing. So you don't want that. You want to have a stable DAG. Um, so those are some of the common common things that, that we see. Okay. All right. Anything else? Any other question? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. That's that's all I wanted to present today. Thanks. People have joined. There is one more demo. <laughs> <laughs> You're scaring me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing screen here. Okay.
So, uh, guys, we'll take a couple minutes break and uh, then we'll have. Uh, I guess we'll have a problem because uh, I just asked if someone wants to do use cases. Okay, um, so anybody wants to work with use cases? Okay, cool, then that's a wrap. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Oh, you want to give me that? I'll take some. Thank you. Great job. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, it is a paper that yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think people have to know the So, for example, one of the questions that I want to see is one thing if you want to do a windmill or a mining or so, so Gendron uh, is the company that we have the uh, ones where you want to collect data from so those so point, point to point yeah, and oh, multiple yeah, points. So now yeah, if you're going to look at the main issue, you have to have a screen project on the way. You have to know a whole lot of other things. You have to know where the part was in the production process. You have to know what machine it was on. You have to take a that information. You have to do the operator work. There's things in data that you come together so that when you get to a point, I'm going to end the uh, the meetup and the end the broadcasting. Thanks everyone for joining. Everything else from that stage forward was all scrapped. That's a completely different real time solution.